So let's say you have two surfaces to be matched, x and y. Okay. We need to define the distance between these two surfaces. And this distance is the shape distance. Okay. So therefore, this distance must be invariant to any rigid transformation. In fact, this should be invariant to the wrong term, it should be invariant to any similarity transformation. Okay. And uh, for now, if we assume that both the shapes have n vertices, uh, this is something you have seen earlier in Professor Suez's presentation. I, without doing anything to x and y, if I just compute xi, the distance between the ith vertices of x and y and add it over all vertices, it also gives me a distance, but of course, this is not a shape distance, right? Is that okay? And that's not going to give you a shape distance, right? Because if I shift the surface X, translate it, this distance may increase. Okay, so this doesn't make sense. Right, because it's not, of course, invariant to rigid motion or similarity transmission, once again, type of it. So, how does one eliminate rigid motion? That's the question, and the added complication is, here, the added complication is, correspondence information is missing. Right. So, what do you do? You have two problems, right? correspondence and rigid motion. You can see that both these problems are sort of interrelated in the sense that if correspondence is available, then there is no issue. I can go ahead and find the optimal rigid transformation that aligns the two. Okay. Now, align the centroids. Second, find the optimal rotation, the way I describe in the first slide. Secondly, if I know the best rigid transformation or best similarity transformation that aligns these two objects, then I can find a correspondence, isn't it? How? If I give you the best similarity transformation that aligns these two objects, how will I find the correspondence then? So if I give you the best similarity transformation that aligns these two, I would apply that particular similarity transformation to the object, right? Okay, uh, Sanchi has an answer using centroids. Can you be more specific? I'm telling you that I'm giving you what is the best rotation you have to apply and best translation to apply so that the two align. So finding that is not an issue. Once I give you that, how will you find the correspondence that this vertex in shape 1 or object 1 corresponds to this vertex in shape 2 and so on and so forth for all vertices? How would you do that? Sachi, if you have an answer, uh, please go ahead. Darshil says we will apply that transformation, okay, and then do what? Maybe you can speak up, Darshil, if typing takes a uh, long time. So we will apply the transformation, and then the closest point we get, that is our. Uh... Correspondence, correspondence point. point, yes. Right. Right. Because I've aligned the two shapes now, right, to the best possible arrangement. Align means now you will have points which are close to corresponding points in the other shape. So all I have to do is after aligning it, take every point, 
find which is the closest point in the other shape and by closest I mean according to the Euclidean distance. Okay, so find the closest point in the second object that would be the best estimate right, of the corresponding point for this particular vertex. Repeat this for every vertex and you will have a point wise correspondence available to you. Okay. Now the issue is of course both are unknown to begin with, right? If one is known, the other can be found as we just discussed, but unfortunately both are unknown. So what do you do? This is again an optimization problem. I hope you see that. And a particular strategy which is very popular is what is called an alternative minimization. Slide here just to write this down. So let me sort of uh, represent correspondence by a vector C, right? C i equals J if vertex i corresponds to vertex J. Okay, I hope the notation is clear. Then you have then propose a cost function, which is a function of two variables. One is the set of optimal transformations. So let's for now ignore scale right, so that uh, I won't be wrong whenever I sort of uh, say rigid transformation. These are one set of variables. The other is what is this correspondence? What's the best correspondence? Okay, and we'll sort of put it in this way, i equals 1 to n, r xi plus t minus y of, even can you finish this? What is the y corresponding to xi? Oh, sorry, vi. It should be consistent. Sorry for that. R T i plus T minus Y of, sorry, again this should be W, W of what? Given, what would be the corresponding vertex to V i, given this C? Clearly C here, it should be T of I. Right. C of i gives me the index of the vertex in the second shape and the vertex is given by W of that index. Hope this makes sense. Yes. Right. So you can see that there are these two pairs of variables that we want to optimize. How do we do that? So what is called alternative minimization. The idea is you basically, okay, Vignesh has a question, how will we deal with the additional freedom? So what freedom are you talking about? C is not freedom, right? It's encoding another variable that you want to optimize. The number of equations is the same. It's not really, so 
how many equations are there right n right or and you're adding this up isn't it and how many variables seven here and n here okay so are you talking about unique solution or something like that I mean, you're not trying to solve an equation right you're just trying to optimize this you want to minimize this cost function so i don't know if i've answered your question vignesh uh, let me continue so what i'll do is i'll first assume p0 okay once i assume c0 let me sort of assume this is the right correspondence then what do i do so since i i this is sort of having faith maybe i don't know if that's the right way to put it so given this correspondence i can now go ahead and compute what is the best rigid transformation that aligns as per this assumed correspondence right that is not difficult next you apply this optimal transformations to your object one and then see do you need to rework this correspondence in other words obtain a new correspondence from this new correspondence again obtain the best rigid transformation parameters and continue doing that till of course there is convergence okay by convergence i mean maybe these correspondences and uh, these uh, optimal rigid transformation parameters are not changing much okay in that is you stop okay and in some sense that's the best we can do right i mean we don't have anything to begin with we can only make some assumptions and then try to improve on those assumptions so that's the idea and you can see why this process is called alternative minimization you sort of assume one is given optimize for the second once you have uh hopefully a better estimate of the optimal second parameters you try to improve on the uh, on the estimate of the first set of parameters okay yeah, i hope the overall picture uh, is clear and by the way this is something that you are supposed to code in today afternoon session okay with of course there is help from my side available and i think you should be able to do okay so let's proceed with this this particular algorithm is what is called the famous the very popular and of course an old algorithm called the icp algorithm standing for iterative closest point algorithm okay so yeah that's the idea i just described so let me just discuss this in detail how so as i said here as i have written here you assume some initial correspondence how do we get this initial correspondence so the idea is given so again i have used a different notation here this should be vi this should be wj so given a vertex i at vertex of your mesh x to which point in the mesh y does it correspond to right? so what you do is you basically find the euclidean distance right of this particular point okay i think maybe i have done it the other way around so in the mesh y right i want to find out to which point does the vertex y j correspond to in the mesh x so what we do is you basically compute the euclidean distance of all points xk in the mesh x 
to this particular point yj. Then you of course take the point in the mix ish, sorry, mesh x, which is the closest. That is your corresponding point. And you of course do this for all points yj's. Okay, so that's going to give you your initial correspondence. Once you have the initial correspondence, you solve this optimization problem. And that will come. Okay, we have seen this optimization problem at least in two sessions, I think. Uh, yesterday's session, we solved this problem. And uh, in a 2D version, we solved this on last Tuesday in Sphere Shape session. Okay. So by now, I hope you are familiar with this. Not of course all details, but at least from an overall perspective, you I hope are aware of this. Okay, so oh, so yeah, estimate the rigid motion translation. Just align the centroids right, as expected, and rotation using the SVD process. So you find the coherence matrix of the centered. Meshes. Okay, that's going to give you your optimal rotation. Apply that rotation to the mesh and then go back to estimating correspondence. Okay, iterate till you have convergence. Let me show you an example of this process. I'm going to use this partial matching problem to demonstrate this. Where do I hope uh, details are visible? So what you see is this is the original red teapot mesh. Right? And I've taken a part of it and I've sort of uh, moved it myself. And now the problem is I want to be able to match this part of the mesh with the entire mesh. Okay, so in some sense, I'm sort of simulating a partial shape matching problem. Is the mesh visible, everyone? Okay. And I'm just applying this uh, iterative closest point algorithm to this mesh here. Okay. And so since it's an iterative process, I'm also showing you some of the intermediate steps here. So you can clearly see there is this black point clouds. That is, I think, after, what, after a couple of iterations. Right? So you can, since I'm applying this optimal uh, rigid transformation that I am estimating to these blue points, you can see that it's sort of taking it closer and closer to the uh, entire point cloud or the original point cloud. And then after about 10 iterations, you can see that it's basically coinciding with the uh, whole mesh. And as far as I remember, I've, it's not, I've not sort of just taken a part of this mesh and put it over here. I've also added noise to this so as to simulate a more realistic scenario. It does pretty well, at least in this example. Okay. <clears throat> but there are several issues here. Uh, can anyone of you think of an issue here with this algorithm? It's not very complicated. It has nothing to do with math. What does this algorithm crucially depend on? To match to a similar site which is not really at the right position. And why does that happen, Vignesh? Why can that happen? Really see if I sort of think of 
this step as the basis of my entire algorithm, right? Because once this is there, then the rest follows. But so the foundation of the algorithm is based on an assumption, right? So what happens if this itself goes wrong? If my initial correspondence, right? And you can see in the algorithm, what is it based on? How am I estimating the initial correspondence? Just depends on the closeness of points in space, isn't it? Doesn't use any shape related information here to estimate the initial correspondence. Right? So if my initial estimate of the correspondence goes wrong, then basically the algorithm will collapse, right? I'll show you an example of that. Okay. Yes, so to handle cattle, but still if you match a spout with any of the spout, that would still be okay. But see what happens here. And if my initial, uh, if the second mesh that I have to match is somewhere over here, just randomly put on this side, where will my initial points correspond to? Right? All of these points will correspond to maybe points here or here, somewhere here. So it's sort of going in a completely different direction. Then once you are in the wrong valley, right? I mean, again, think of this in terms of an optimization. Um, yeah, use the red thing. So this kind of a cost function that you're dealing with is certainly not convex. It means that you may have something like this. If your initial point is somewhere here, right, C0, R0, C0, you're not going to be able to reach this point here, which is sort of, at least in this small example, if this is the global optimum. You're always going to get stuck here. Okay, so that mathematically we can prove that this ICP algorithm, it certainly converges, but only to a local minima. And that should be obvious from this example, right? It's, I mean, if I run more iterations of it, it's not going to move from here. Because most of the mesh does match well with the red mesh. Right? So it is not going to be any movement here. Okay, so it has sort of converged, but of course to a local minima and of course it's very far from the global optimal solution, right? I hope you can see that. Have I lost some of you? Or not gone into the math at all. I hope you get to see sort of uh, trying to connect the optimization with Suyash's session uh, while discussing these things. So I hope you are following me. So, okay, okay. thanks. Thanks for the feedback because otherwise it's like talking in the dark. Okay. So, in the original paper, so this method is very old, it's by uh, Bessel and McKay. The paper is called A Method for Registration of 3D Shapes, published in the IEEE Transactions of Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence way back in 92. What they proposed is, so they also knew of this problem. In fact, the paper proves that uh, their algorithm is going to converge and it will converge to a local minima. So what they said is, uh, in order to avoid this issue, what you can do is you can start with several initial estimates. Okay, so 
by that i mean so this this is the mesh right the initial correspondence process is kept the same but what they say is you apply thousands of something like that vignesh but uh, not stochastic in nature what they say is so how many degrees of freedom are there for r and t we have just discussed this problem is in 3d so this is r3 right the three euler angles just to bring in some concept from yesterday's talk there are three parameters in order to specify a 3d rotation and there are three parameters to specify a translation vector in 3d so this is a six dimensional space right what they say is you sort of take enough samples of this six dimensional space and apply all these sampled rotation and translation to your mesh that you want to align and for all those different so when you apply these r and t to this particular blue mesh you will get several the same blue meshes but transform for all those transformed blue meshes you compute the local minima and then you compare all these local minima and try to find for the global minima of course it goes without saying that if you take enough samples of this six dimensional space you will end up with a global minima but uh, i think it even without knowing the details i think it should be obvious that it sounds completely impractical right it's a six dimensional space uh the number of samples if you want any decent number of samples here you would need days and days together to finally finish all the computations right so yeah and in fact the good thing about their paper is they admit that it is sort of impractical yes so for every uh, different pose that you sample you that other pose may also get stuck in other local minima but the idea or their idea is if you have enough samples to begin with then amongst those sample you will always also find a global optimal right and global optimal you can easily compute right all you have to do is to compare this cost function with this cost function and this cost function so so that can be handled okay but just this idea that you will have to take a good enough number of samples of the six dimensional space that is uh, very impractical all right okay so let's look at so this is sort of the basic algorithm for rigid shape matching and then there have been several variants of this basic algorithm okay i'm not going to discuss those in details except for one another very popular variant of this uh that's called the sparse iterative closest point algorithm uh, given by mark polly et al uh quite recent i mean i don't know 2013 can be classified as recent or not but at least as compared to the original paper it surely is much more recent i'll just summarize what is their basic idea and again i need to zoom into this so you can see it no one is it's so complicated to zoom in uh just let me know if you can see this graph clearly is the graph slightly visible okay so what this graph is on the x axis you have a single variable z okay on the y axis you have the absolute z to some power t okay now 
our original cost function that we were trying to minimize in this rigid ICP process was this height. So what, what is this thing in the curly braces? What does it tell you? What is it encoding? What information is it encoding? It is encoding by how much does the transformed point Xi not match with Yi? Okay? Right, so I have estimated an R and T. I have applied that R and T transformation to the point Xi. At this minus this tells me what is the difference or basically I can think of this as an error, right? And the cost that we are trying to minimize here therefore is the norm of the error squared. Okay, so in this particular plot, you can think of the variable z as the error. Okay, and then you can think of the y-axis as the cost that this error contributes to in our optimization problem. Okay, so this red curve that I hope you can see is nothing but z squared, which is the current cost that we are considering, right? So every point there will be an error associated with it and that error will contribute a certain cost to the entire cost function, right? So what do you see here, right? So with, of course, what this means is whether the error is positive or negative, it doesn't matter, it contributes the same amount and that is how it should be, that's fine. But what do you observe here? So if there are points, let's say my mesh has 100 points, okay? Out of those 100 points, let's say there are five points with, I don't know if you can see this number, this is the number three. But let's say out of this 100 points, there are five points with an error of three. What will happen to my cost function? Anyone? So compare it with, let's say there are 100 points. Okay, let's take two cases. All 100 points, let's say, have a error of 1. Okay. Let's take a second case where 95 points have an error of, let's say, half. 5 points have an error of 3. What will happen? Can somebody compare these two cases for me? And most I, probably his five points may be the noise because of the noise no no that's fine whatever is the reason behind this it's a different thing but what will happen to your cost function overall cost function so by overall i mean all you add all these errors together Error is skewed in the second case. In other words, there will be a higher cost here, right? right? Because remember, you're doing Z squared. So each of these five points will contribute roughly with nine to the cost function. Right? So that's right, 45, right? Nine fives are 45. So only five points contribute 45 to the cost, whereas here, right, all 100 points are making an error of one. So in total, the error here would be 100. So 100 points are contributing a cost of 100. Here, five points are only contributing roughly half of that already. Okay, so that is that how you want your cost to be? This is the least square uh, cost function, right? 
what does least square do it sort of treats every point equally so every point is equal for this cost function and practically you don't want your error function to behave this way why because as darshil pointed out maybe your scanner through which you are acquiring these points has some noise and maybe at some points only there is high noise right so again this same situation there may be five points in which there is high noise due to some reason now if you take this cost function these five points are going to drive your optimization process okay and even though here 95% of the points seem to do well because of these five points what the process will do is it will introduce more error in this 95% of points trying to reduce the error of only these 5% of points right i hope i am making sense so i don't want this to happen i don't want the noise to completely derail my process okay what do i do basically if there are if there is a high error it should not contribute too much to my cost that's the basic thing and how do you do that instead of z square so if you just take absolute of z you can see this is how it will perform you take a p which is below 1 right so if i take a p which is between 0 and 1 there are graphs drawn for different p's so i think this is for p equals half if i'm not mistaken and for p equals 0.1 it's almost flat so whether the so it's like you would want to select a threshold right so of course higher error should contribute to the cost but beyond the point it shouldn't sort of exponentially contribute to the cost so this is one particular contribution that is there in their paper right they make the cost function just by this change instead of square you take a p which is between 0 and 1 by doing that you get this sort of a graph and the behavior is therefore your cost function is insensitive to outliers so the points where the error is unusually high is what we call outliers if there are outliers in your process you use a least square cost function it, that's going to derail your process but instead of least square if you use a p norm if p is between 0 and 1 right you're going to get insensitivity to outliers but again this is not easy because how do you solve this optimization problem if this is a square we all can we know this is a smooth convex differentiable cost function so you differentiate this set it to 0 you obtain the optimal r and t if p is between 0 to 1 this is not even a norm okay norm has a certain uh, conditions attached to it three of them i hope some of you at least are familiar with them and again whether you like it or not convexity plays a role any norm is a convex function okay but if you look at the other norms here right so for example z equal sorry p equals uh, 1 so this p equals 1 and p equals 2 if you look at the graph of this function right you can see that they are basically convex functions right but for any p which is less than 1 you sort of see it sort of curves out this way means that this is not a convex function and norms have to be convex okay you cannot then this is not a norm basically that's what i want to tell you and the problem is not that this is not a norm the problem is that this is not a convex function 
and if you have paid some attention to my session on day one, non-convex functions are going to again create some sort of a problem. Okay, they are not easy to optimize. So the optimization method they have proposed, I'm not going to go into the details. I just want to give you a summary of this is the augmented Lagrangian. Again, I didn't discuss this in the session, but we discussed a more primitive version of this, the dual ascent. Okay, so you've understood the dual ascent, then understanding augmented Lagrangian is not very difficult. Okay, so this is one sort of a variant of the basic ICP algorithm. Another framework, right? So this thing is, I wouldn't call it a variant of ICP. It's a completely different framework for finding correspondences. So finding correspondences and alignment is also sometimes called as the registration process. Uh, I'm not going to discuss this at all. I'm just giving you the references because I think it's a very nice framework uh, to study. Uh, so those of you who are interested, and of course it relies heavily on the two things. So you like it or not, linear algebra and optimization. It also makes heavy use of what you studied on Monday, the Laplace filter and the filter and their eigenbasis. It's just so that you see the relevance of what you have studied in this. Class.